The question of who wrote the Gospels can elicit some very different responses and emotions depending on who you ask. And so today, we'll look at those very answers, and more importantly, why it matters. One of the biggest criticisms that I often hear about Gospel authorship is that most scholars believe that they were not written by eyewitnesses, which would mean that the Gospels of Matthew and John were not written by the apostles they are often associated with. Of course, Mark and Luke were never considered to be written by the apostles. But that still asks the question of whether or not they were eyewitnesses. And if they weren't eyewitnesses, does that mean that the words, sayings, and miracles of Jesus are not trustworthy or reliable? And so we'll be looking at some of those questions and how can a Christian respond to such criticisms? Now, I typically like to look at things through the lens of both faith and reason and look at the arguments from both scholars, Christian or otherwise, as well as the tradition of theologians and apologists, which include those who are often called church fathers, meaning the early Christian theologians and scholars. Of course, there are those who would say, why utilize tradition, which is of man, when you can just use God's word? Well, because none of the gospel writers actually claim to be eyewitnesses. The eyewitness identified in John 1935 is most likely referring specifically to the crucifixion, not the entire gospel. Nor do Matthew and John actually claim to be the apostles of the same name. These beliefs are actually based on tradition. So this leaves us with faith and reason. Faith tells me that the Gospels are inspired by God. So regardless of how they were written or who wrote them, I believe that they contain not only theological truth, but also are grounded in historical events. I want to put this out there first and foremost, because wherever this exploration takes us, I don't want to lose sight of this particular belief. And so now let's look at the possible authorship of the canonical Gospels. We can find some hints in the text itself, as well as some writings outside that were written around the same time, or at least within the first two or three centuries. So to get the first argument out of the way, there seems to be a popular claim that since the apostles were a bunch of uneducated fishermen, they would not only not have known Greek, which the Gospels were written in, but also wouldn't have the first clue about writing and publishing a narrative account. Well, that's not only harsh, but also makes a lot of assumptions. First, only one of the Gospels was ever believed to be written by a fisherman, that being John. And yes, that Gospel is very well written, poetic even, and contains some deep theological content. But John was in the inner circle of Jesus' disciples, along with Peter and James. He would have been privy to the deepest thoughts and teachings of Jesus, and because of this, would have had some significant insight into who Jesus was. And I do have a compelling theory about the authorship of John that we'll get to when we look at each gospel. Also, the idea that working class people would have only known one language, I think is uniquely American perspective. Throughout history, people have known multiple languages. There would have been the home language, in this case, Aramaic. There also would have been their synagogue language or religious language, which would have been Hebrew, and they would have studied the Torah in this language. And finally, there was the language of commerce, which at this time would have been Greek. And as fishermen, James and John would probably have known this language as they owned this business with their father, Zebedee. And Matthew was even more likely to have known Greek, and even perhaps Latin, as he would have worked very closely with the Romans. He probably would have not only been educated, but also good at keeping track of details. And while it is a work of fiction, I really love the depiction of Matthew in the Chosen series, which follows the tradition that he did indeed write the gospel that bears his name. But just because they could have written the gospels, the question still remains as to whether or not they did write the gospels. But before we get to the individual evangelists, I want to direct your attention to a couple of links that I put in the description. I recently became an affiliate with the Logos Bible Software Company, and they have some really great and powerful programs that lets you study the Bible and do cross-references and has a number of commentaries. And so if you order from one of the links that I put in the description, you'll get some discounts and some even some free items. So check it out if you want to up your Bible game. Let's continue with Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is traditionally thought to be the first gospel, and as such appears first in the biblical canon. Tradition also holds that Matthew the Evangelist is also Matthew the Publican, or tax collector, who became a follower and one of the twelve apostles of Jesus. Most scholars today refute both of these claims. So let's look at some more evidence. But to address the first claim, we need to back up and look a little bit at the history and composition of these Gospels, particularly what are called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic is Greek for same eye. It means to view together. This is because of the similarity between the Gospels, which is easily seen simply by reading them. In fact, one might notice some passages are literally word-for-word -word copies of the other two. So, did they copy each other? The scholarly view is, to put it simply, yes. Yes, they did. And I'll get to the two-source theory in a moment. 
Now, some Christian apologists will conclude that since they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, each of the evangelists was given the same words to describe the same events, and that's why we have such similarity within the Gospels. But then, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of rhyme or reason between those passages and the passages that explain similar events that are very different, or that the order is different, or particular words are changed. And so that has become known as the synoptic problem. And so when we see that there are similarities, yet also differences between these three Gospels, and how do we reconcile this? And this brings us to the two-source theory. It seems that Mark was written first because of his style and description of events, which seem to have been added upon by Matthew and Luke. Luke even tells us that he used other sources, and he actually corrects some of Mark's grammatical errors. So the prevailing thought is that one of the sources utilized by both Matthew and Luke was Mark's Gospel. They both also share another source, which is unknown, but is typically referred to as Q, which is from the German word Quelle, meaning source. Now this begs the question, if Matthew was an eyewitness, why would he have to borrow content from Mark and others who were not eyewitnesses? There is a contrasting theory by some scholars who believe that as Matthew was composing his gospel, he was also the one who compiled Q, which was a collection of other sayings, parables, and miracles of Jesus, and then he only used Mark to fill in the gaps of his own gospel. And while this is not widely held, it still presupposes that Mark would have been written first, and that both Matthew and Luke had access to it while they were writing their own gospels. So let's look at Mark's gospel. It does seem to be an original work and most likely written shortly before or after the year 70 AD. His gospel is the shortest and has a sense of urgency to it. It was written in Greek, but seems to have been authored by a Palestinian Jew who became a follower of Jesus, just as the apostles were. But who was Mark? One popular theory goes back to the end of the first century from the writings of Papias, Bishop of Heriopolis. The church historian Eusebius quotes him as writing, Mark became Peter's interpreter and wrote down accurately, but not in order, all that he remembered of the things said and done by the Lord. For he had not heard the Lord or been one of his followers, but later, as I said, a follower of Peter. Peter used to teach as the occasion demanded, without giving systematic arrangement to the Lord's sayings, so that Mark did not err in writing down some things just as he recalled them. For he had one overriding purpose, to omit nothing that he had heard, and to make no false statements in his account. This person is identified as John, who is also called Mark in the Acts of the Apostles, and who is said to be interpreter of Peter. There is also another John Mark who appears in some of Paul's writings, who seemed to have been a traveling companion with Paul, although they had some disagreements at times. And so if this was the same Mark, or the same John Mark, it was obvious that he was very much involved with the early church, and he may have been a brother of one called Barnabas. So either way, he definitely knew the apostles and heard stories from them, and this is where he would have got his information. So not being an eyewitness himself, he certainly got his stories from those who were. This is not to say that he could not have encountered Jesus at some point in his life. And in fact, he may have even put himself in his gospel as a sort of autobiographical cameo. In Mark 14, 51 and 52, we are told of a young man who was present at Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested. He tries to flee, but one of the crowd grabs a hold of his tunic. The man managed to leave the garment behind and fled away naked. Because this is such an unusual detail found only in Mark's gospel, it has been suggested that that was Mark himself. And based on Acts 12.12, 12, some believe that the Last Supper may have actually been held in the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. Perhaps after the meal, Mark snuck out and followed Jesus and his disciples when they left the house and went to the garden. I think it's a pretty good theory. So with some ideas of who Mark may have been, let's get back to Matthew. Of course, tradition holds that he is St. Matthew, who was the tax collector and became one of the apostles of Jesus. If you hold this view, you would be in good company, as this was also the belief of Irenaeus, Tertullian, Origen, and Justin Martyr, among others, who lived in the second and third century. However, modern critical literary analysis would suggest that this may not have been the case, as we looked at earlier regarding the synoptic problem and the two-source theory. I'm not saying it was or wasn't, just giving you current scholarship. But because it was thought to be the Apostle Matthew so early on in church history, this was the prevailing thought. And no other candidates would come forward because everyone just assumed it was the Matthew that was in the gospel itself. However, here's another theory. Just as the, all the apostles would have been founding churches and preaching as they were going on in their journeys, 
they would have eventually settled down. And perhaps someone in the community, the Matthean community that was really founded and taught by Matthew, began compiling all of these stories that he heard from the apostle himself. And eventually he took those stories along with the Gospel of Matthew, which had already been put out, and then these other sources, which we call Q, and he came up with what was eventually called the Gospel of Matthew, because St. Matthew was one of his sources. What about Luke? He is probably the easiest to identify because he never claims to be an apostle or an eyewitness, but was certainly a member of the early church and knew many of them. In fact, he tells us straight out in the beginning of his gospel as he writes, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And again, in the beginning of Acts of the Apostles, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So yes, Luke wrote both the gospel that bears his name as well as the Acts of the Apostles as a two-volume work. And as with Matthew, a number of the church fathers in various documents do connect him with another figure within the New Testament. He was believed to be the Luke that is mentioned in some of Paul's writings, and therefore a known leader within the early church. In Colossians 4.14, Paul refers to him as a physician. Also, due to his elevated use of Greek and the way in which he describes some of the ailments that Jesus cures, this tradition has continued to be held by many Christians. For Catholics, he is even spoken of as the patron saint of physicians. While not all scholars believe that this Luke is the same as the evangelist, he certainly was present in the early days of the formation of the church. Finally, due to the detail that he gives to the infancy narrative, there is a strong tradition that he spoke at length with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and may have even lived in her home for a time being, as she would have also been very involved in the early days of the church, as is evidenced by her presence in the upper room at Pentecost, which Luke also documents. So finally, we have the Gospel of John. And like Matthew, there is the tradition back from the second and third centuries that this is indeed the apostle. And here it is the apostle John, who is the brother of James and the son of Zebedee. And I'll get more into the scholarly debate about the authorship of John in a further episode when we talk specifically about his gospel. But some of the reasons are the dating of the gospel between 90 and 100 AD. And also, as I mentioned before, that he was a fisherman and that there is the highly elevated theological composition. But also when we look at his gospel in, as a separate from the synoptic gospels, it is very different. The order of events is different. There's a number of miracles in John's gospel that are not in the others. And it very much reads um, as a theological treatise, not so much as a historical account. And so that is another way that we might look at John's gospel. And so here's another theory about how perhaps John the Apostle really could have been the one behind this gospel. John is the only apostle the tradition holds was not martyred or killed for his faith. And while we don't know his age when he first started following Jesus, he was the younger brother of James and could very well have been a teenager. So if he was around 15, around the year 30, this would make him between 75 and 85 years old when the gospel is believed to have been written. And it would be reasonable to believe that he would be settled in a community or local church at that point in his life. He would have been teaching and reflecting on his life and in particular his experience with the Lord. Now, early on, the apostles did not think that they had to write anything down because they believed that Jesus would return in their own lifetime. The other apostles at this point had been killed. Other people have been writing gospels, those who were not eyewitnesses, and John probably would have been familiar with these gospels. The parishioners in the Johannine community may have been pressuring him to write down his own account, his own words, but John was getting old, and maybe his Greek wasn't very good. So he used a scribe, as Paul had often done, to begin writing things down. John, inspired by the Holy Spirit and reflecting on his life so close to Jesus, begins to tell his story. The interpreter, in reverence to John, refers to him as the beloved disciple, most likely something the humble John would not have referred to himself as. But the scribe was writing the story as told to him by his beloved pastor at this point. This would also make sense of 1935, in which the scribe makes an editorial note on the eyewitness to the crucifixion. This was the gospel according to John, and as a believer, seems to make the most sense, even from a historical point of view. Now, as briefly detailed within this video, there's a lot of different opinions and scholarship on who wrote the Gospels. And I'm really not here to debate on which is the correct version or not, because one, I don't know. 
And two, I don't think it's really worth debating. That's not to say I wouldn't love to hear your comments and thoughts about it in the comments below. But ultimately, we know that throughout history, there's been different methods of understanding scholarship, and there's been different methods of understanding authorship. And really, if you believe that this is the word of God, who wrote the Gospels isn't as important. For the Bible itself doesn't connect the dots for us. It doesn't say that so-and-so is the same person in this passage as they are in this passage. What it says is, this is the word of God, and how are we to understand it? What is clear, however, is that most of these writings were written in the first century, and there would have been much dialogue with those who Jesus did know personally. The Twelve were not the only ones who witnessed the teachings and miracles of Jesus, nor were they the only disciples who were sent by Jesus to preach and minister. If you were looking at this from a purely historical lens, then these stories would have been fresh in the minds of many. And as Luke said, he did a lot of research regarding what he wrote in his works. The reason that we eventually have four Gospels and not more is because they were those that were believed to be written by credible sources in the earliest days of the church. They reflected what had been taught orally by the apostles and were the manuscripts that were being used for the gatherings and liturgies of the early Christians. Other accounts would be accessible as the centuries progressed, but these were never adopted by the church nor put into the accepted canon of scripture for various reasons. And if you were looking at this through the lens of faith, then the human authorship is really not as important as the divine authorship. Most Christians believe that the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit and contains the truth necessary for salvation. And so God certainly could have inspired people that didn't know Jesus personally. In fact, most of the theological interpretation in the New Testament comes from Paul, who never saw Jesus before the resurrection. However, I also believe that God uses our own intellect and skills to do his work. So one or two of the evangelists certainly may have indeed been drawing from first-hand experience, and no doubt all of them talked to someone who did. Next episode, we will begin with the reading of the Gospel of Mark, and I'm really looking forward to this new playlist in this fast-paced, action-packed Gospel. Until then, keep reading the Word, and God bless.